McDonald and my name is Vicky McDonald and it's my great privilege to be the IFLA president for 2023 to 2025. Today I'm joining you from The Hague in the Netherlands uh, where I've been attending the the first day of the IFLA governing board meeting and joining me is Sharon. Hi Sharon, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. It's very good to have you in The Hague with us. So I'm Sharon Memmers, I'm the Secretary General of IFLA and uh, it's it's a, a huge pleasure to be in The Hague with the governing board and with Vicky. And welcome and thank you very much, everybody, for making time to join us today. Thanks, Sharon. And I think we will probably have other members of the governing board joining us as well. Uh, we've just finished our governing board meeting, so I know that they were keen to join. So um, in the chat, I do invite everybody to uh, put in where they're joining us from today. And as you can see on the screen as well, we do have interpretation today. So you can either click on the link or use the QR code and then select the language that you would like to have our discussion translated into. Um, we do have um, a, a number of uh, topics that we will cover today. And um, But first, um, Sharon, do you want to explain how the town hall works? Okay, so the town hall is um, something a little new for us, although anyone used to anyone living in, in North America will probably be well used to them. The idea is that, yes, we'll talk about a few topics, but the real interest, I hope, is that you will ask us some questions and we will respond to the questions around the topics we're addressing, but also... Um, any other question that you want to raise about IFLA, please feel free to ask us. If you can put them in the Q&A rather than in the chat, it will be much easier um, because then we can make sure we go through them systematically. Um, but this is very much um, a bit of an experiment for us. It's a kind of an informal way of, of we hope, communicating with our members. Um, and this is, I hope you've seen this reflect in the way that we've been trying to do communications over the, the last few months, and certainly since Vicky became president, is that we are increasingly trying to at least send regular me uh, messages out to members and giving you the opportunity through all kinds of channels, whether it's social media, surveys, now the town hall, to really engage with us. Um, bit of an experiment. If we say something that isn't clear, please do ask for clarification, because if you don't understand it, it's very likely that someone else doesn't understand it either. So please, please do ask if you want clarification. So that's roughly how it will run. Um, and back to you, I think, Vicky. Thanks, Sharon, and fantastic to see so many colleagues online with us today. I've just seen Karen Downing from uh, Michigan in USA pop up. We've got Pramila from Sri Lanka, Patrick Danowski I saw flash up as well. Lots of uh, colleagues from the United States, North America, and also Europe. So fantastic to have you here. Um, as we said, we're going to run through a few agenda items today, um, and there's a couple of the important ones that we'd like to talk about. We've got at least 60 to 90 minutes allowed for the uh, the town hall. As um, Sharon said, there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions, uh, and we'll pause at the end of each topic so that you can ask questions. But of course, at the end, there's also another opportunity to ask questions. So um, do put them into the Q&A, and then Sharon and I can do our best to to respond and uh, welcome Alexander from Brazil. Fantastic to see South America represented here today. So first up, the first topic I'd really like to talk about is the IFLA Information Futures Summit, which of course um, I'll be hosting in Australia in my hometown, Brisbane. So it is a, a new event format for IFLA in that it's very much a curated program and we have curated the program around topics related to information futures and the role of libraries in, in impacting information, knowledge, with a big focus on looking towards the future as well. So let's have a look at the next slide and I think we will see an image of the website. So if this is the website where you can find out lots of information about the Futures Summit, um, here you can see um, 
the the river, the Brisbane River that winds its way through Brisbane, and that is what is actually reflected in our uh, summit logo, the Maywa River winding through Brisbane. It's very much a global event that we are hosting and looking forward to welcoming colleagues from all across the globe to come to Brisbane. It's an absolutely fantastic time to visit Brisbane. It's spring. Uh, so the great weather. And as you can see on this slide, and I'll show you a slide further on, it is a very compact city in the central business district. On the left-hand slide there, you can just see on the edges the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre where we will hold the summit. My library, the State Library of Queensland, is just a short five-minute walk away. And then across the bridge that you have the central business district with many hotels and, and shops and, and libraries to visit as well. So the um, the and also I should mention here the URL for the website. So 2024.ifla.org is where you'll find all the information about the program. So if we take a next look at this next slide, you'll see some of the fantastic speakers that we will have joining us from uh, across the globe. Um, and we have purposely looked both within the field and outside the field. And we have some of the speakers listed here today, but also many more are being added to the program as well. So I do encourage you to frequently go back to the website to check out who is going to speak. Really fantastic to have Carla Hayden and Gates Kate Zwart for the Library of Congress joining us online for the uh, the summit. But we also have Masood from Leeds University and also Sherpong and Jean from Singapore who will be sharing with us the exciting work that they're doing in implementing AI and technology as well. But we're also keen to bring people from outside the library field because there are so many other experts and professionals who are working in the information and knowledge field. Uh, so we've got listed here Jean Burgess, uh, Damien Cardona, who will be focused on misinformation. Paul Crosby will be speaking uh, with Rebecca Giblin, and they, of course, have a big interest in e-lending. Uh, De Daniel Hook from Digital Science will be talking about open science, but also the importance of trust. Marek Kalkowicz uh, from Queensland University of Technology will focus on artificial intelligence. He's just uh, published a book which is going really well on the digital economy, uh, the art. Uh, economy and arc AI rather, and the rise of the digital minions. And uh, I've heard Marek speak many times and I think he will be fantastic. But we'll also have uh, Professor Michael Deswani and Associate Professor Kim Osman talking about trends in information and knowledge. And also really pleased that Anna Vodulak will join us as well. Um, and she will talk a lot around uh, cultural heritage as well. So a very varied program that has been developed. And uh, as I did say, we are adding speakers and panellists to the program all the time. So do check into the, um, the website frequently. The curated program that we've developed has a focus on uh, plan, uh, plenary sessions where um, some of the key experts that I've just mentioned will talk about their theme with a focus on the future. But following the plenary sessions, we'll have a number of concurrent sessions which enable you to explore the topic from different angles and also think about how the topic that's being discussed relates to your library, your community, or your country. And a really big focus on the program is talking about how you can, what messages you can take home and how you personally can connect to the key trends and ideas that are being discussed at the summit. As I said, it is a new format for IFLA. It is a very much a curated program, but we also realise that people are always very keen to share the work that they're personally uh, undertaking in their libraries. So we do have Ignite Talks, and so these are seven-minute, short, sharp presentations from colleagues from across the globe who share with us the work that they're doing. The call for Ignite Talks has closed. We had a fantastic response, and we now have one of our panels reviewing all of the submissions that we received for the Ignite Talks. And um, if you submitted to the Ignite Talks, you can expect to hear back from the panel by the end of April uh, in relation to the submission that you've made. Um, so let's explore the next slide as well. And um, I think this is going to be a really exciting part of the summit. 
we'll be releasing the IFLA trend report for 2024. This is the first time in over a decade that we've done a comprehensive review of the IFLA trend report, and it's currently being researched by Professor Michael Deswani and Associate Professor Kim Osman, who are based at the Queensland University of Technology. They're really taking a very global view to looking at what are the trends in information and knowledge across the globe. And they've been supported by a steering committee that was formed with representatives from across all continents as well, because we do realise it's important that we represent what are the global trends as well. So we will be able to share um, the work in the lead up to the summit in September. And we'll also, um, Michael and Kim will develop different scenarios that will enable us to explore some of these trends that will be revealed in the trend report in the lead up to the summit as well. So it is a part, that, a part of the summit that I'm particularly looking forward to. And of course, I think these trends will very much influence the discussions and the conversations that we have at the summit. I'm sure from what I've already said, you can guess some of the trends that will be in this report, particularly artificial intelligence. I know in my community, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and the responsibilities that we have as libraries in adopting AI, but also how we ensure that our communities are aware when resources are being presented through an um, artificial intelligence as well. If we go to the next slide, um, the other important uh, report that will be released at if at the summit is the new IFLA strategy for 2024-2029. Hopefully over the last six months, you've participated in some of the pulse surveys that we've conducted um, and they have very much influenced the development of the strategy. At this week's um, governing board meeting in The Hague, we'll see the first draft of the IFLA strategy, which reflects the comments that we've received from members um, over the last six months, but also builds on the discussions that the governing board had when we met in The Hague in December. I know at my library, when we're doing our strategic planning, we look at a range of reference documents of what libraries are doing around the world, but we always look at the IFLA trend report and the IFLA strategy to inform the work that we're doing. So this will be an opportunity to explore the new IFLA strategy when we come together in Brisbane in September and October. We also, um, if we go to the next slide, um, we know that for many of you, it's a lifetime dream to come to Australia and you want to make the most of the visit. And so we know that library tours are always really popular. And so we will have a program of explorer tours in Brisbane, but also across southeast Queensland. And this slide shows you three of the libraries that will be available for you to visit. On the left, we have the Supreme Court of Queensland and the Supreme Court Library uh, will be open for you to explore, which is quite unusual. It's not a library that many people would think to go to, but I am Marion Morgan Binden, who's the CEO there, will be there to welcome you there on the day. The middle slide is from my library at the State Library of Queensland, and this is Kural Dargan, which is our First Nations space within the library, and this is part of the outdoors area. So it's where we have yarning circles and sharing stories about the history and culture of Queensland's First Nations peoples. And uh, it is a, a great space to explore. We're, we're located on the Brisbane River, so this is a beautiful outdoor space to explore. And then the slide on the right is at Ipswich Library, which is a city just outside of Brisbane. You can easily access by train. And it has Australia's only children's library, so um, a great space to explore. But we do have many other libraries that we will have open on Thursday, um, the 3rd of October. And we will have uh, librarians ready there to show you around their libraries. We're very proud of our libraries. We've got many award-winning libraries in Brisbane and Southeast Queensland. So I do encourage you to consider um, um, making the time to attend one of those tours. In the lead up to Brisbane as well, we also want to get everybody um, immersed in Brisbane and we've put together a list of books that are written around Brisbane or have Brisbane 
as their uh, place of, of where the setting is for their books. And we'll be releasing all of that information on our website as well. So I take encourage you to um, explore Brisbane before you get there, read one of the books, and then we'll also be posting uh, what everybody's reading in the lead up as well. And if we go to the next slide, so this is uh, a photograph of the Brisbane city, um, which expands on what we uh, showed you earlier. So over on the left-hand side, there's little white um, areas here. Is um, That's the Brisbane Convention Centre. The State Library of Queensland is just a five-minute walk from there, and then you can walk across the bridge through to the CBD. So we have the Supreme Court Library there, the Brisbane Square Public Library, uh, the Queensland University of Technology, and many other special libraries as well. But as you can see, the Brisbane River does wind through the city. There's many public, um, lot, lots of public transport, but also uh, what we call city cats, uh, boats that enable you to, to go from place to place. And you'll be able to catch the city cat to the University of Queensland Library, uh, which is, again, another award-winning library. And uh, I know the team there at the University of Queensland will be thrilled to show you around their libraries as well. So, of course, um, it is a big experience to come to Brisbane, and we know that you'll be thinking about what will you get out of a visit to Brisbane. Um, the trend report and the different plenary sessions that we have will give you insights into the future of information and the role of libraries, and ask us to explore what is actually possible for our institutions and our, our communities as well. So lots of practical ideas. The program will have plenty of opportunities for you to be chatting and interacting, but also engaging with each other as we explore some of the topics as well. I know personally, when I go to any ISLA gathering, it's also the opportunity to network and meet up with colleagues. So of course, the summit is an opportunity to meet with your colleagues from across the globe. We're also inviting many Australians to come to their first ever IFLA experience. And uh, I know if Australia, New Zealand and other countries in the Asia Oceania area uh, this will be the first opportunity for us to host many uh, international colleagues in our in Australia. So we're really looking forward to uh, meeting you and showcasing our work. Um, and of course, coming together at a Willick is always energising and and creates a lot of enthusiasm about the country, what lays ahead as well. So I do think it's going to be a very exciting time. And uh, as I said, do go back to the um, the website at twenty twenty. 2024.ifla.org to get the information. They'll also be sharing a lot of information in all of the communication channels at IFLA, so the newsletter, our emails as well. And we're, you may have seen if you've on been on social media in the last hour that we've just announced um, if you uh, register uh, in the next few weeks, you'll go into the draw for a free registration at the next IFLA Congress. So that's a, a further incentive to uh, register and secure the early bird registration rate as well. So I do hope to see many of you in Brisbane on the 30th of September to the 3rd of October. So I think we if we go to the next slide. Thanks, Stephen. And um, another key um, topic that we wanted to discuss with you today is towards uh, charity status for IFLA. And you may recall that in the last update from the IFLA Governing Board, we talked about that IFLA was pursuing ANBI status or charity status for IFLA as an association. And I know that many of you in your libraries would probably already have charity status. And I know um, at last week's town hall, we had many colleagues from the Netherlands and their comments was that their libraries already have this charity status as well. And if we go to the next slide, um, this, of course, is our vision to be a vibrant, inclusive and international library field long into the future. And our purpose of achieving ANBI status is tied up with our strong commitment to have a sustainable organisation and uh, and build partnerships with others as well. And in attaining charity status, we can be a very appealing partner to other organisations and, uh, and it opens up a range of new opportunities to partner with different associations and organisations. If we go to the next slide. Um, 
Of course, um, IFLA, one of the strengths of IFLA is our committed volunteers, uh, you, who work with us to uh, further the work of IFLA. And of course, that is also a very much an appealing aspect for other organisations to be working with IFLA. We have a very clear mandate as to what we want to achieve for the world, for our communities and in our libraries. And we are a trusted organisation with a significant membership across the globe. So that are, are very uh, significant incentives that will encourage other organisations to partner with us. But also having that charity status is also another incentive for organisations to work with us as well. So I did mention it was ANBI. So this is um, what ANBI stands for. So in the Dutch um, legal framework, but essentially it means a public benefit institution. And uh, to achieve the ANBI status, we need to have that the work that we do is for the public good and public benefit. And at least 90% of the work that we do needs to be having that public benefit outcome. And of course, the work that IFLA does already meets that criteria. But to achieve the AMBI status within the Netherlands, we need to make some changes to our statutes. And, uh, and that will be undertaken at the General Assembly in June. So we'll require an amendment to the statutes to confirm that if we were to close, which is very unlikely, that any remaining funds that we have would pass to a charity with a similar purpose. So another charity that is focused on public libraries and public goods to the community as well. Um, it is a requirement in the Netherlands to have that clause in our statutes, which is why we require the General Assembly to approve the change of statutes. Under our statutes and rules of procedure, it is only the General Assembly that has the authority to make that change, which is why we'll have the change presented to uh, the General Assembly in June as well. Of course, what it doesn't mean, and I think this is also something to emphasise, that there's no change to our current decision-making processes. It is still the members who will have the voting rights for any uh, significant decisions in accordance with our statutes and uh, rules of procedure. And the other important thing is that it doesn't have, require any additional reporting requirements for our committees. It is something that would be managed through the IFLA headquarters the reporting that's required to meet the Dutch legal framework as well. So um, in the coming weeks, you'll hear a lot more information about the change, uh, the AMBI, what we're calling the AMBI status. We'll be discussing it at the governing board in, over the like, next two to three days, um, and we will discuss the statute wording that we will propose to the IFLA members. So the week commencing the 22nd of April will provide more information around those changes and certainly in our update following the governing board meeting, provide an update on that as well. In May and June, we'll uh, schedule some specific sessions uh, like this town hall, so an online forums where people can ask uh, more information about the proposed change, um, answer any questions that you have as well. And then on the 20th of June, when we have the General Assembly, will be the opportunity for members to indicate whether or not they support the change to AMBI status or not. Um, and then following that, um, the General Assembly, if we receive a positive vote, we can then commence the work to change to a charity status and that have that AMBI status as well. So I think if we go to the next slide. Um, Oh, Sharon, it's over to you for some general updates and discussion. Oh. Okay, thanks. Um, shall, do you want to do any questions now or should we wait till the end? What would you prefer? Um, I, I think it might be a good idea to do some questions and answers because I have covered a fair bit yeah. already. Um, yeah. And um, so I think, you know, so far we've had a, ch a chat around the IFLA Information Futures Summit and also the AMBI status. So I'll just um, go into the Q&A as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I can see there's one question there um, from Patrick. Uh, will there be an opportunity for sections to comment on a draft of the strategy? Uh, so yes, Patrick, uh, once we've done some, um, the governing board, as I mentioned, will be um, discussing the first draft of the strategy. We've got some workshops over the next two days, but certainly we will be seeking input 
from our members on the strategy as well. I mean, we know that it's something that's very important to our members as well. Um, Sharon, do you want to answer the question around um, updates on Willick 2025? Yes, so um, on Willick 2025, in actual fact, we're going to be discussing that at the governing board meeting um, over the coming days. It's, I can't remember whether it's tomorrow or Wednesday, but that will be discussed. At the moment, we, we can't really share information, but um, we are going to be looking at the potential um, options for well, the bids for 2025. Yes, uh, I know everyone's always really keen to find out yeah. where, <laughs> who's hosting, where, where is it going to be. So um, we certainly need to work through those um, those discussions over the next two days as well. So I can see there. There's a question around: uh, Will changing to a charity organisation change the impact of members in the governance of IFLA? Um, so I guess essentially what will happen is if we um, we have the vote at the General Assembly on the 20th of June, if it's affirmative, we then go through the processes of registering with the uh, the Dutch legal authorities. We change the statutes, but essentially there's no changes to the voting mechanisms. It is still the General Assembly and the members who control the decision making. We still have our governing board in place and all our other um, structures as well. I, I think, Sharon, that's probably the key points in relation to that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, one, one of the things we've actually thought about doing, given some of the questions we've had about this, is to see if we could perhaps get um, one of our, our Dutch members to join us on the town hall who was already an AMBI organization so that they can explain what it means. But this is essentially um, a status change, not a status change will still be the federation, but it, it enables us to, um, to really have certain advantages. It helps us partner. Um, it helps us bring everything under one roof. It will actually help, I think, quite a lot in, in just the whole transparency issue. So we think it's a very positive thing to do and there are advantages to it. And I think certainly one of our Dutch um, members commented the other day and said, yep, it's just advantages. It's a, it's a positive thing. So um, I, I, I think, you know, the other thing you could do is is if you're really interested, just do a Google um, for an AMBI organization in the Netherlands and you can see. So a museum, any kind of charity, they're all AMBI status and it's quite helpful to just see how others are doing it. But it will make no real change to how members interact with us, um, but hopefully bring some advantages. We also have a question from Frederick um, asking if IFLA becomes a charity, will its relationship uh, with Sigil change as well? In a sense, Sigil is already an AMBI um, and it's already a, a charity. Um, it should make our relationship simpler and more transparent. So I know that um, having spoken to Sigil board members before, they were actually quite keen for us to pursue uh, the AMBI status in the past. Um, so I, I think that what it will help is just it will just make everything simpler and more transparent. So for me, it's a very positive move. And I, I, I'm i fairly confident that Sigil will see that as, as, as positive too, and that members will probably see greater transparency in that relationship, which I think is, is a good thing. Yeah. And of course, we still have our agreement in place with our, our financial relationships with, with um, Sigil as well. So they will still be in place as well. Um, I see also on, on the same topic, a question from Fred, uh, will it enable opportunities for fundraising? Um, I, I know yes. from my library, um, you know, one of the perspectives <laughs> is it certainly opens up new people who you can work with and partner with mm -hmm. as well. Um, do you want to respond to the fundraising aspect, Sharon? And, and I think that that is an important point, and it is one of the drivers really for helping, uh, for, for persuading us to really go for the AMBI status, because um, many of you know that we also have the SIGL, but we also have internally um, an IFLA Foundation, SIF 
Sif, which sounds like something from Star Wars, but it's actually a, a foundation where we're able to take in um, grants and funds from other organizations. But because it's separate, it, people don't always know about it. So we have a partner, for example, Arcadia, with whom we're doing a major project and funding a major project on knowledge rights. And it, it, in a sense, once we have the AMBI status, we will no longer need to have that separate SIF um, and that SIF. So it will make any it will mean that any money that um, IFLA is deploying, if you like, will be much more visible in our accounts and it comes into a single organization. And it also means we can partner, we hope, with many of you on this call today um, to pursue other funding opportunities to strengthen the global library field. So, yes, it absolutely does open opportunities. And that's one of um, the key drivers, because clearly we're looking at um, the big topic we're looking at is partnerships and financial sustainability at the moment. So um, it will certainly help that. And we look forward to uh, working with many of you in the future to help really uh, diversify our funding and um, go from strength to strength. I can see um, on the call we have a number of past treasurers who would all be able to attest to the complexity of our financial accounts. And I think that's one of the discussions we've had today at the governing board is if we have the ANBI status, it may enable us to lessen some of the complexities and uh, and can consolidate some of our um, accounts within IFLA as well. So I think that would be a great outcome as well. So we also then have a question uh, in relation to the the summit, um, uh, and I guess it's asking around virtual participation. Um, of course, running a hybrid co uh, conference or uh, event is very expensive. Uh, so that is one of the things that we've needed to consider. Um, but we also know that we need to uh, make some of the sessions available. So we've been um, been able to negotiate that we'll be able to make the opening events and the closing events available on YouTube as well. So um, that's how we'll be able to manage that opportunity. So I might just check into the chat to see if we have any um, uh, questions. Uh, yes, um, uh, just clarification, it's ANBI, A-N-B-I, uh, which is a Dutch abbrevi abbreviation as well. Um, So I think we've. Yeah, I read I read that someone is surprised to learn that IFLA doesn't already have a status like this. I confess when I came to IFLA, I was surprised too. I assumed when I was applying for the role that IFLA was a, a charity and was quite surprised to learn that it wasn't. So uh, I think this is a, a great, um, you know, a great, a great thing. And I think Tapaya, um, can we bring Tapaya in who wanted to say something? The governing board member um Stephen are you able to, whether you were able to do that yes she's got the possibility to speak right now but would need to unmute Pai, you just muted at the moment so um if you unmute it's okay Okay, I say she's I'm fine. Sure. Okay. Okay, well, shall we move on to the next section? And then we certainly do have the opportunity to come back for more questions later as well. Okay, so I think it's over to me. And I'm going to do really just some general updates on what's happening at IFLA. Um, you know, today we're not trying to cover everything. We We can't. Um, but over the course of the year, and as soon as we get some positive feedback from you all about the idea of doing town halls, I hope we'll cover the most important areas. Um, so I thought it would be actually good to celebrate a little some of the great work that um, IFLA and the, the team and also our incredible volunteers um, have been doing around the world. Um, and here are really just a few examples from the last few months. So. You know, thanks to our work, um, another key UNESCO text is highlighting the role of libraries and this time in culture and arts education. 
Um, and these are great reference points for you in advocating for the inclusion of libraries in relevant strategies and ideally, of course, in budgets. So I think, you know, we've got an incredible advocacy team who do amazing work um, at getting libraries a seat at all of the tables that really matter to, to us. Um, we've also just put out our 2023 trend report. And I know we've got the 24 one, which is the, the completely new one coming up in Brisbane, but I, I think it's really important and exciting that our 2023 one was produced from the inputs of the emerging leaders uh, who came really to the Rotterdam conference. And that I think has been, um, so it's a really interesting one to see what emerging leaders think are those real trends. Um, and we know that uh, we've been doing some some surveys, as you as you know, and that we know and we also do the analytics on our website. And it's our standards, which is our most consulted resource, and that they continue really to represent an absolute key means both for sharing good practice and for enabling cooperation. And so the revision of our standards manual is a really important moment. And um, pictured here on the slide, you can see the third edition of the world through picture books. And it's one of our highest profile publications celebrating both children's literature and highlighting the key role of librarians in building a love of reading in the young. And perhaps less artistic, but also critical is our Marrakesh monitoring report. And that provides updates on which countries have signed up to the Marrakesh treaty and are so committed to removing unnecessary bar barriers to access to knowledge for persons with print disabilities. And crucially, it also notes which governments have more to do. So it's a great reference point for those looking to work across borders. And finally, we are producing still our newsletters. And I do encourage you to look at them because there's some great materials, some fantastic articles. And the most recent one, which is on a subject close to my own heart, which is focused on diversity, equity and inclusion, and included some absolutely amazing material from our professional units who continue to really do such exciting and fantastic work. Um, so that's some of the highlights that, uh, over the last few months. And I think going to hand back to Vicky to talk about the governing board. Thanks, Sharon. It's always extraordinary to see how much work is happening across IFLA through the different groups and committees as well. So thank you. Um, as I've, I've mentioned earlier at the commencement of the town hall, the uh, governing board is meeting in The Hague this week. Uh, we've just finished day one um, and we started this morning with our finance and risk committee meeting and we've continued the discussions and a focus around finance today. So we've had the auditors um, come today with their preliminary first draft audit report, which was very positive, um, and that's part of our preparation for the General Assembly as well. Um, we also, this afternoon, also started uh, our workshop, a discussion around the future sustainability and how we set up IFLA for many years to come. And I think um, over the last few months and, and certainly discussions that we had in Rotterdam, we, we know that we need to be focused on how we ensure that IFLA is a sustainable uh, organisation for decades to come. And we need to look at our financial models and, and the work that we're doing as well. So that's all part of the discussion that we're having in the workshop. One of the commitments that we made at our first meeting as a governing board in Rotterdam was around governance and transparency and really sharing uh, information around the work that is being progressed through IFLA, but also around the decision making of the IFLA governing board. Uh, as uh, Sharon mentioned at the commencement of the town hall, we've had a big focus on communication and ensuring that we have timely and fulsome communication to you on the key uh, decisions and matters being discussed by the governing board. During the, uh, the governing board meeting um, over the next remaining two days, we'll also have a further discussion around transparency and discuss what further actions we can take to ensure that our members are informed and understand the work that is being progressed through IFLA. 
We'll also have a um, the draft IFLA strategy, which I talked to you about earlier, uh, and that will be an opportunity to review the first draft, which is based on the input that we've received from our members through the Pulse surveys in, over the last few months, but also the work that was done by the governing board at our December meeting. Um, and of course, once we've had that discussion, we'll be able to share that with members as well. We'll also have uh, a discussion around Willick 2025. Um, we, as you know, we uh, issued an expression of interest for host countries for Willick 2025. We will be discussing that, um, I think it's tomorrow's agenda. Um, I see that there's a question around the timeline for sharing the decision, and we'll certainly share that timeline when we share uh, the communication around the highlights for the um, from this week's meeting, um, and we'll share that next week. So I can't share the timeline uh, at the moment because we haven't discussed that particular paper um, as well. The other important milestone that's coming up in the uh, next few years is IFLA 100. So the centenary of holding Congresses, and that is in 2027. So we recognise that that's a really important milestone for any federation, and we'll be uh, commencing the planning around how we mark that important milestone. We'll also have updates from the Professional Council, the Regional Council, and also the Management of Library Associations section. And uh, one of the other new um, uh, topics or standing items that we've in, um, implemented into the Governing Board agenda is regular reporting from our advisory committees and the opportunities for the chair of advisory committees to attend the Governing Board meeting and provide an update. So we will have an update from copyright and other legal matters um, tomorrow, I believe, from memory um, to the governing board. And that's really important to understand the significant work that is being progressed by advisory committees as well. So that's just a snapshot of what we're covering um, over the next two days. But as I said, of course, we will share the highlights next week on all the topics that have been covered um, at the governing board this week. So Sharon, there's a number of opportunities coming up for members to engage. Do you want to take us through that? Absolutely. Um, so this month, um, we're going to be opening up um, the, uh, well, we're going to be launching a survey on the IFLA strategy that we've talked about quite a bit. We're really keen to uh, get views and get feedback because that's the way that we know that it's relevant, that we can improve it. And so you'll get that opportunity to comment on the first draft of the strategy following the governing board's um, discussion. And we've got the process of, of LIC as well, um, the, um, the Congress model, the review of, of that that Leslie Weir is, is leading. And there will be a survey, a pulse survey on that. So that will be another opportunity for many of you. And I know there are people on the call. I, I saw that Sylvia from, from Sweden. I know that um, the Nordic uh, associations have already sent some really um, some really great contributions directly to Leslie about the review. And we hope very much that many more of you will contribute because it's such an important part of IFLA's work and such a great opportunity. It's really important that we get everybody's views. So please look out for that. Um, it, it does mean we are sending you quite a lot of surveys, but it's so valuable when you respond to them. So please do. It's hugely important. Um, and then in May, we will be. Oh, the other thing, of course, we've got in April is that we are reaching out um, to associations to find out more about what you're doing on climate action, because that, again, is a really important part of the work that we're doing. Next month, we're going to be holding some town hall meetings to talk through the draft of the new strategy and to get your views. And you'll still be able to continue, of course, to um, contribute online and share your ideas about the strategy online. And we'll also ensure that you can ask any additional questions that you have about our the move to an AMBI status, the charity status, and the rest of the General Assembly agenda. And we'll also start the consultative phase of the trend report. So that's in May. And then in June, we have our General Assembly, which will be on the 20th of, um, of June. It will be hybrid. So if you happen to be in The Hague on the 20th of June, it would be absolutely great um, to see you. If not, we've got a great platform and you'll be able to fully participate online. 
Um, so that will be coming up in June and we'll also have a full um, consultation as part of the uh, LIC review and some more engagement around the trend report as we get everything ready to launch the final version, both of the strategy and the trend report in Brisbane um, at the end of September. So that's what we've got coming up. And I hope very much you will all engage with that. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Certainly plenty of things coming up. Um, just in relation to the Willick review and the Pulse survey, um, I see that it's already landed in my mailbox. Um, so uh, do check your inboxes because you should have an email there in relation to that first Pulse survey around the Willick review. I know many members are very keen to provide their comments on the Congress and the future of the Congress and what they'd like to see. So this is your first opportunity uh, to do that, but there will be four, um, a total of four Pulse surveys um, across the next few months in relation to that as well. Now we do have, um, uh, I thought there was a question. Um, I've lost my q and A. I um, I might just have to close it. Oh, here we are. So I saw a question from um, Vivian Lewis, um, and the question was around, perhaps it was covered under the standards, but just wondering about the use of IFLA's many guidelines documents coming out of the session sections, for example, the guidelines for CPD. Um, I think, well, you did mention, Sharon, that the standards is one of the highest hit areas on, on the website, and I'm, I'm guessing guidelines would fit into that same category. I think, yes, I, I, I think so, but I don't have the data on, on that. Um, but yes, we have, um, it, it, it is generally the sort of professional standards and the work and the guidelines and all of those documents that are widely consulted and widely used by our members. And that's what the analytics are saying. So, um, yeah. Um, and, um, and Patrick's got another question. So thank you, Patrick. You've certainly given us lots of questions today. Um, so if, and he's this marked it specifically for you, Sharon, around the discussion about Dubai having the consequences of IFLA's futures. But I think all of the, all of lots of topics will come into the Willick review and, and things for us to consider um, as well. We've certainly um, we've also looked already at um, the expressions of interest and uh, the requirements around those, I think, which were influenced by some of the discussions around Dubai as well, uh, making it much more clearer around the criteria for our Congresses as well. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I, I was trying to work out exactly what you were asking, Patrick. And if um, when you say for IFLA's, do you mean IFLA's future? Um, the, is that specifically around the review of the LIC model or or the sort of existential future of IFLA? I wasn't quite sure. If you can clarify, I will try and answer. I mean, clearly... Um, you know, the discussion around Dubai um, and, and, you know, has, has had, a, I think, a profound impact on everybody, whatever your view point. So um, it's not something that we will ignore, but we do need to look forward and look at, I think, one of the, one of the things that we'll look at in the review of, of LIC is that looking at how we engage around the world and that it doesn't need to be always through a major congress or a lick model but actually how are we ensuring that we are relevant and supporting and delivering that public benefit if you like around the world in every part of the globe um uh, so that everybody can find their place in in ifla I don't know whether that's answered your question. If it hasn't, ask me another question. If it um, and if I'm still not an answering, then just contact me as well separately, and I'll try and respond better. Thanks, Sharon. I'm sure Patrick's got your email, so um, he can <laughs> contact you as well if he he wants to ask anything else. I think that we've, from what I can see, we have covered most of the questions that we've received. Um, I'll just go back in. But I think really, I mean, what we've covered really shows 
the the breadth and the depth of the work that's being uh, progressed by the IFLA team, you know, a very active team doing significant work here in The Hague, but also the work that's being progressed by um, our members and volunteers all across the globe through their different committees and advisory groups as well. So we do very much value the work that everybody does, their commitment to IFLA, but also the commitment to the role of libraries in our societies as well. Um, I'll just... I do think we've covered everything. Can you see anything? I, Sharon, I think we have. We have. Um, again, uh, you know, if you think of questions afterwards um, that you would like to ask, um, please do. I mean, do feel free to contact me and, and I will try to um, to respond as, as well as I can. Um, you know, this isn't the end of the conversation. Uh, please join us for future meetings as well. I think I just saw a question that has gone into the chat about when we'll hear um, about the acceptance of the Ignite talks and the hotel information. Um, so actually I can't, oh, this is a confession. I can't remember when we're going to hear about, but but Vicky so, will know when we're going to hear about the Ignite talks. <laughs> so the Ignite talks, um, we will actually, the, the, um, the panel's currently reviewing all of the applications that we got. We did have a fantastic, um, um, response. We certainly didn't have to do an extension because we did get so many great responses. So that's happening across April and we anticipate letting the successful uh, Ignite Talk respondents know by the end of April as well. Um, the hotel information I understand will go up in the, sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and I've also had an alert from the IFLA team that the, the read information is up on the website today. So that gives you a list of books about set in Brisbane. So you can get certainly into the mood for Brisbane um, and read books. I've certainly got one with me uh, to read on the plane going home, Eden Glassy by Melissa Lukashenko, um, which um, I, I can recommend. It's uh, shortlisted for many prizes at the moment within Australia as well. I might just go back to a couple of questions that have been asked in other town halls, and I know that we have had uh, a number of questions around that. Uh, we've had questions around grants. So the grant information, um, there's several grants that are available at the moment, and the information around those grants is again available on the summit website at 2024.ifla.org. And there was also a question around who can attend the summit. Uh, the summit is open to everybody. There is no limits on representation from associations or institutions. Um, if anybody um, is, is very welcome to attend, and we certainly hope to see as many people there as well. Um, a question around the early bird. Um, the early bird registration closes the 1st of June, um, so um, there's still a little bit of time. But as I mentioned, uh, there is a, an incentive to get in with your early bird registration at the moment and the opportunity to um, receive free registration, go into the draw to receive free registration at the next Congress as well. So certainly um, plenty there. Um, there's also another question, which I think is a, a, um, a good one, given that Leslie's on the um, on the call, is a question about why we are, the question is, why are we getting only one bid per year for the World Congress? Do our requirements for hosting place too much burden on the hosts? And I, I would, I, I, I think that it's, um, it's a tricky one to answer uh, and that's part of what the review I hope will be addressing and looking at um, and I have you, you know I, I'm, I don't want to sort of suddenly put Leslie on the spot to, to to comment but we will this is clearly such an important subject that what we will be doing is with a, a future town hall um, we'll actually have Leslie I think center stage talking about the um, the lick review uh, and all of these questions, I think, are being addressed. There are there are lots of areas to address on on this um, process. So um, it's not it's not maybe a great answer to your question, I'm afraid. But hopefully that says the answer will be coming soon, um, and it is one that we're looking at. Um, Leslie, whether you want to at least comment or or Vicky, I don't know. 
Yeah, well, I think it's certainly, like you've said, is something that needs to be considered. Uh, and we, um, the Willick Review has, um, you know, three working groups who are progressing different aspects of the Willick Review. Um, and one of the things that we need to consider is around the criteria for host countries nominating or responding to an expression of interest. How how do we make it easier for countries to, to host a Congress? Um, what is the appropriate model? Um, Congresses at the moment are very expensive events to deliver and to plan. So we need to be thinking about that. And uh, and I think it's also useful to note that IFLA is not the only one who are looking at their, their conference models all around the world. Library associations and other member associations are also looking at their conference models and, and what is the best way to, to bring members together in the, you know, the 21st century as well. So it's a very complex area to navigate. Um, but um, I know Leslie and, and the team who are working with her through those three working groups will certainly um, give a, um, have a lot to consider. But, of course, there's the opportunity for everybody to have input into that process through the Pulse surveys as well. So thank you for some great questions as well. Well, Sharon, I think we may have covered everything we needed to do for today. We've certainly got yep. lots of comments as well. So um, I do thank everybody for joining us, no matter what time it is where where you are. Um, it's it's very civilised here uh, in The Hague. It's um, nearly just on 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Um, so um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. As I said, the, um, the governing board is meeting this week. We'll provide you an update next week through the usual channels uh, and provide you an update on the decisions that have been made, but also the key topics that have been addressed. And we'll also be sharing with you some of the opportunities to join other town halls in the coming months as well, um, and particularly around the ANBI status in the lead up to the General Assembly on the 20th of June. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Sharon, for participating and answering some of the questions. Um, and yeah. thank you to the team at IFLA for their work in facilitating the town hall and particularly to Stephen Wyver, who is in the back room uh, of <laughs> today's session, um, working the slides for us as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining thank us. You. And, um, Thanks very I, much. Thank you. I do hope to Bye. see many of you in Brisbane for the IFLA Information Futures Summit. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.